Welcome back, or welcome, as the case may be. We've had a few more people join us, and we still have a few who are trying to get here because of uh, weather-related travel issues. So uh, we'll look for them a bit uh, tomorrow, I suppose. You'll be very happy to know that I have no announcements. <laughs> right. This isn't church, right? <laughs> so my only duty is to introduce to you uh, the person who will introduce our keynote speaker. So let me present to you Dr. Kimberly Baker of St. Meinrad School of Theology and Seminary, and she will introduce our keynote speaker. Good evening. Good evening. It's a true pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Carrie Robinson. Carrie is the Global Ambassador of Leadership Roundtable, an organization dedicated to promoting excellence and best practices in the management and leadership of the Catholic Church in the U.S. Carrie is a popular speaker and preacher around the globe, and that includes at the Vatican. Prior to her work at Leadership Roundtable, Carrie served as the Director of Development for the St. Thomas More Catholic Chapel Center at Yale University. There, she directed a $75 million capital campaign. And might I add, a successful $75 million capital campaign. And the purpose of the campaign was to expand and endow the ministries of the chapel and to build a Catholic student center there at Yale. Her fundraising experience inspired her to write a book, and the book is called Imagining Abundance, Fundraising, Philanthropy, and a Spiritual Call to Service. I can attest that it's excellent reading, whether you're in fundraising or not. It'll expand your sense of God's abundance, God's abundant gifts to us, and it'll renew your sense of the goodness and generosity of the human family. Carrie is a graduate of Yale Divinity School, where she earned the degree of Master of Arts of uh, excuse me, Master of Arts in Religion. Now here's what's probably the most important thing that you need to know about Carrie. You need to know what lies at the heart of all she does. And that's a great love for the church and a desire to see it flourish. That love was cultivated from an early age through her involvement in her family's grant-making organization, the Raskob Foundation for Catholic Activities. Carrie's keynote address, is entitled, Exhortations of Beauty and Meaning, the Role of Preaching in Spiritual Leadership. Please join me in welcoming Carrie Robinson to the podium. Thank you so much, Kimberly, and Father Mike and Carla. Thank you for including me today. I'm so grateful to be with all of you on this beautiful campus tonight and for the next two days. On behalf of anyone and everyone in the Catholic Church worldwide who cares deeply about our faith, I want to begin with my gratitude. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the care and attentiveness you bring to preaching. Thank you for dedicating three days to be present at Notre Dame and to avail yourself of the tremendous resources provided by Notre Dame and specifically by our hosts. Thank you for prioritizing preaching. And those of you who teach homiletics, who teach seminarians and lay ecclesial ministers and who coach preachers, thank you and bless you. Your spiritual leadership matters, and I am personally and profoundly grateful. This is perhaps the most humbling and privileged of all of my invitations to speak, because I am addressing at least 280 of the most accomplished and knowledgeable people on the very subject I have been asked to address. One way to look at this is that I have the least expertise and certainly the least experience actually preaching. You have the most, but the best preachers I know rarely have the weekly, if not daily opportunity to hear other preachers. That I do have and I have for my whole life. 
I once even, for my work to bring resources to strengthen the church, conducted a personal and private Zaga-like survey of parishes, beginning with the first Sunday of Advent and ending with the Triduum. I went to a different parish for Mass every Sunday and as many weekdays as I could. In every case, I learned something and appreciated something new. I was measuring all manner of things, hospitality and welcome, the quality of music, the active participation on the part of the community, the degree of prayerfulness, and of course, the quality of the homily. Homilies matter enormously. At some masses, I wept for how meaningful and beautiful the celebration of the Eucharist was. Admittedly, at others I wept for how astonishing <laughs> at others I wept for how astonishing it was to me that laity seemed to settle for mediocrity overall. One particularly painful memory was when the homilist announced that he had had a very busy week. So for anyone who was here last Sunday, you were going to get the same homily he gave last week since the readings continued to speak about John the Baptist. This made me apoplectic. Mass should never be an occasion of sin. <laughs> so that you know the context of my reflections, permit me to tell you something about my background. And Kimberly, you did such a gracious job. I have worked on behalf of the Catholic Church at the local diocesan, national, and international level since I was 14 years old. I have a profound love of the church and hold its potential in the highest esteem. The church's explicit religious mission has formed the person I am. That it is the largest global humanitarian network in the world renders me forever committed to its health and vitality. I've studied theology all of my life and listened attentively when people preach. This love of the church was initially the consequence of being born to a family with a 75-year history of serving the church through the instrument of a private family foundation. What this means is that 75 years ago, our great-grandparents, John and Helen of Raskob, had two intentions. The first was they wanted all of their resources to benefit the Catholic Church, but they left that intentionally broad. Essentially, to this day and for the last 75 years, anything the Catholic Church is interested in, it advocates, offers the world and Catholics anywhere in the world is eligible for funding. Their second intention was that their children and descendants would be stewards of the foundation's resources. Now this also seems fairly straightforward, except John and Helena had 13 children, one of whom my grandmother had 14 children, and this family is massive. To this day, five generations later, there are close to 100 of my cousins and my brother and my dad actively involved in the activity of the Raskob Foundation. It's voluntary and non-remunerative. No family member is paid, but we all regard it as a privilege to immerse ourselves in the life of the church, the better to anticipate unmet and undermet needs. The consequence for me personally is that my earliest heroes and heroines were women and men, ordained religious and lay, who daily stood at the vanguard of human suffering. They bore witness to the worst of what humankind can do to one another and to our common home. And yet they brought their intense love of Christ and their faith to bear on all of their activity. Daily they showed up to alleviate suffering to provide catechesis, to extend justice, to advance peace, to provide health care, and most importantly, to offer mercy and hope to a broken world. I couldn't believe as a child how much they witnessed, and yet their palpable sense of joy was so evident. I wanted to be like them and thought I could never be as selfless or holy as them. 
So I prayed that my life could be formed in some fashion to help them, my earliest heroes and heroines, so that their ministry could flourish unencumbered. And by extension, maybe my life would have meaning and purpose too. It was the witness of women and men like them that compelled me to love the church and our Catholic faith from the earliest age. But it is your witness and your preaching that has helped me to stay. One of my first jobs out of college was to work for Woodstock Theological Center, where I met the dazzling and erudite Father Walter Burghardt. As I am sure many of you know, it was from Woodstock Theological Center that Father Burghardt founded Preaching the Just Word at the age of 77, mind you, later enlisting the talent of Father Ray Kemp. Preaching the Just Word was a five-day retreat experience on preaching, on the gospel, and Catholic social justice teaching. I was deeply inspired and persuaded by Father Burghardt's conviction that we must apply biblical justice and not merely ethical, legal justice to matters concerning the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized. 30 years ago, he believed that by, quote, focusing on abused or neglected children, those with HIV AIDS, the elderly, women, African Americans, refugees, and prisoners on death row, that we become sensitive and faithful to the responsibilities we have undertaken in our covenant with God. We must hear the cries of the poor, he says, because social doctrine should evolve in large measure from the needs of people who share more of Jesus' crucifixion than his resurrection, end quote. I am haunted by how prophetic he was and how urgent his charge to all of us is today. And what a privileged opportunity you have to preach the just word, especially in a wounded church and a divided nation. Perhaps because of our wounded church and divided nation, I find that some of the most meaningful and nourishing experiences of the liturgy happen during conferences and convenings, after intense deliberations about the church, about our politics, about our personal and communal suffering and sin. To break and come together for the celebration of the Eucharist can be some of the most beautiful and unifying experiences. The other particular example of grace that comes to mind is when we come together for a mass of Christian burial. One thing we as Catholics have the potential and often do very, very well is funerals. Preaching at a funeral can quite literally make one want to change one's life, to be more loving, to appreciate life, to ensure we are in right relationship with God and with one another. Think of all the people who might only come into a church these days because of the funeral. Don't we want them to come back? 20 years ago, I moved from one side of the philanthropic coin, helping people give money away, to fundraising, being responsible for it. Mind you, I was very content working with Catholic foundations as an advisor in their philanthropy. I was happy giving other people's money away. But one fateful night, I received a call from Father Bob Boulogne, the Catholic chaplain at Yale University, a call which changed my life. He called to tell me that he had finally persuaded his predominantly lay board to take fundraising seriously and start a capital campaign. I still didn't understand why he was calling me. I had no training or interest in fundraising. But he said, Carrie, your name came to me in prayer. Now, that is about the best fundraising pickup line I have ever received. <laughs> How do you argue with that? <laughs> and I was horrified because I had no intention of ever dedicating my life to the arduous and painstaking task of raising money. And I was desperately trying to think, how can I be polite and say no, when I remembered that I was seven months pregnant with my second child. And I said to Father Bob, thank you for thinking of me in prayer, no less. 
my husband and I are expecting our second child. Long silence on the phone. Then he enthusiastically congratulated my husband and me, said, this is wonderful, new life, so happy for you, you can work from home. (laughs) (laughs) And then in all seriousness, he said, Carrie, listen, I know I'm springing this on you. Just pray about it for five days. That's all I ask. Call me Tuesday night, and whatever your answer in prayer is, of course I will honor, respect, and accept it. I readily agreed. I knew after five days of prayer, my no would be so eloquent and convincing. And of course, I found myself saying yes. Father Bob became my closest, closest friend in life. Perhaps because of my orientation to preaching the just word and the privilege of having heard so many superb homilies across the country and world, I naturally resonated with Father Bob's preaching. In fact, I was awestruck. His homilies were exhortations of beauty and inspiration. He made it seem so easy. But the truth is he labored for hours with each homily, praying over the readings at the beginning of the week, making sure he was applying them to the concrete realities and concerns of the day. He was a firm believer in Karl Barth's advice to preach using the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Often he would conclude his homilies with the invitation to come to the Eucharist and pray for a certain grace, to be more loving, to grow in holiness, to slow down, to enter more deeply into one's relationship with Jesus, to cultivate forgiveness. His homilies were instructive, challenging, and motivating, truly worthy of standing ovations. I personally always wanted to start the wave. But on more than one occasion, we were reprimanded by him not to clap, reprimanded. He joked that if he allowed the applause, he'd have to permit the booing. (laughs) Father Bob was a superb spiritual leader. The quality of his preaching was inextricably linked to his effectiveness as a leader. His pastoral presence, his preaching, his vision, his dedication, his commitment to his own spiritual development, prayer life, love of the sacraments, were all one of one piece in his vocation and in his leadership. This is what you do as a spiritual leader and as a preacher, whether male or female, ordained religious or lay, You point people to awe and reverence, the kind that is found when we encounter and are made aware of beauty, goodness, mercy, love, truth, excellence, community, and communion. As a Catholic Christian leader and a preacher, your responsibility is to bring people closer to God, to make intimate friendship with Jesus possible, to connect the gospel with the lived realities of people's lives, to capture their attention and command their respect. A central purpose of preaching is the same central purpose of being a faith leader, evangelization, to help people cultivate an adult mature life of faith, the better to act on that faith in the church and world to grow cognitively and effectively on one's faith, to bring people closer to Christ. Good preaching is a tool of recruitment and also a tool of retention. Please don't think of preaching as an isolated talent or skill separate from one's other responsibilities because its potential to inspire one's community is perhaps the greatest vehicle through which one can lead. The best preachers I know share themselves in a vulnerable way with their communities. People yearn for the experience of believing and belonging. People are hungry for an intimate knowledge and relationship with Jesus Christ. We want to see integrity and authenticity in our spiritual leaders. We want to know, or at least intuit, that our faith leaders are wrestling with scripture, applying it to their lives, attending to their own personal life of faith, praying deeply, and acting in a manner commensurate with their words. 
Parenthetically, I think this is partly why Pope Francis has captured the imagination and hearts of Catholics and non-Catholics alike, even of non-believers. There is a consonance with his words and actions. Finally, I have observed that often the best homilies are offering insights the preacher himself or herself most needs to hear, even subconsciously. Allow me to share some of the more imaginative and effective practices and resources that some of the best preachers and homilists and spiritual leaders I know utilize. The first is homily duty. One pastor I know well established homily duty in his parish. Modeled after jury duty, it was understood as a civic responsibility conferred upon all registered members of the parish. Juries consist of 12 parishioners of all ages and perspectives who meet with the pastor to discuss the readings and offer insight connecting the passages with the concerns and topics of the day. One's obligation does not end with that, however. The group meets with the pastor once more the following week to critique the homily, including delivery, intonation, word choice, quality of exegesis, length and acuity. Takes a brave pastor to do that, but can be profoundly effective. Second, priest support groups. A few of my favorite diocesan pastors formed a priest support group shortly after they were ordained. They meet faithfully throughout the year and always dedicate some time to a prayerful discussion of the coming Sunday's readings and ways to apply the gospel to current concerns weighing on their parishioners' hearts and minds. This can be applied to deacon support groups and lay support groups when those laity are also called to preaching in their leadership and ministries. Third, small church communities. My friend, Father Bob Boulogne, introduced a small church community structure within the wider faith assembly at Yale, encouraging small groups of students, faculty, and community members to meet weekly to pray, be challenged by the readings, and enter more deeply into Christian life. Commentaries and historical background on the readings are provided and members of the small church communities are encouraged to discuss the readings in the context of their lives. Key perceptions as well as unresolved questions are recorded on the back of each attendance sheet. And when the pastor prepares his homily, he takes cues and inspiration from these accounts. As he notes, the quality of the liturgy is significantly enhanced when a sizable percentage of the community has already read, prayed with, and wrestled with the readings. They are eager to learn more and often hear their own insights woven into the homily. Now, I just want to make a shout out to Father Art Baranowski, who is a good friend of Father Bob Beloyne's and um, taught him everything he knows about small church communities. <laughs> Thank you, Father Art. One pastor pays close attention to what people say to him after Mass. Father, I really liked your homily. He stops them and says, what did you like about him? What grabbed your attention the most? Or if the person didn't particularly care for it, what didn't you like about it? How could it have been strengthened? He believes rightly he is responsible for what people hear, which means clarity, simplicity. Even though his audience might be highly intellectual, the goal is to point people to encounter Christ, to deepen their relationship with Christ, to yearn to be Christ-like. The best compliment he said he ever received was when multiple people with vastly different life experiences would tell him, I felt like your homily was personally directed at me. It was exactly what I needed to hear. The fifth observation is the centrality of joy. The world is full of heartache and misery, no doubt about it. We can't be um, inured or immune to that. But we're also called to joy, just as my earliest heroes and heroines were, despite being at, at the vanguard of human suffering. Joy is constitutive of the spiritual life. I went to Yale Divinity School, and one of my classmates 
was also a woman who ended up being a lay ecclesial minister at a parish um, and had a wonderful experience there. When she was traveling on vacation, she just happened to a local parish, none, nowhere where anybody here is from, I will, um, as a disclaimer, it wasn't in any of your states, um, but she couldn't believe how lackluster the celebration of the Eucharist was. Everything was done by rote. There was no intonation. It was sped along. It was all kind of muted and just really, really devoid of any emotion or passion or interest. Um, and and it, it frustrated her tremendously. And she told me about this and she said, Carrie, I was so tempted to tell the, uh, to tell the pastor at the end of mass, Father, I know that this is the holy sacrifice of the mass, but you are not the one being sacrificed. <laughs> It has to be about joy. Sixth, enlist the help of close friends in the faith community. I was close friends with Father Bob. His leadership and his effectiveness, the role that he played in the community mattered deeply and personally to me. I wanted him to thrive. Despite the fact that he was one of the best homilists I ever encountered and prepared days in advance, I would call or text him when news would break to make sure he was aware of what people would be bringing with them to mass the next morning. What is likely on the minds and hearts of his faith community, what they would be pondering. I never wanted Father Bob to be caught off guard, to appear out of touch or aloof, out of touch with the concerns of the community. I live in Connecticut and the days following the unfathomable gun violence and death of children at Sandy Hook Elementary School, it would have been unconscionable to ignore the gospel's implications and avoid mentioning it. This is as true of the church's sexual abuse crisis. Seventh, one particularly innovative and new resource is available free of charge, Catholic Women Preach is a global platform for ordained priests, deacons, catechists, retreat directors, and all involved of the ministry of the word in the Catholic Church. The website features theologically sophisticated Catholic women who offer reflections on the readings for Sundays and important feast days by video and transcribed text in English and Spanish. As the website indicates, the initiative is a response to Pope Francis's call for a, broad, for a broader and more active engagement of the baptized in the preaching mission of the church and is a deeply faithful, hopeful, and joyful initiative intended to build up the church. Co-founder and preacher coordinator, coordinator Betty Ann Donnelly describes her work in this way. It has been a privilege and absolute delight to reach out to so many gifted, faith-filled women around the world and invite them to contribute a reflection. Since its la launch two years ago, according to co-founder Deb Rose Milovec, Catholic Women Preach has more than two, 215,000 views. Total watch time is well over 1 million minutes, which is 723 days worth, if you are mathematically inclined. And the number of preachers published on that site to date is 160. Priests who utilize this resource emphasize the unique value of women's voices, perspectives, imagery, and insight. And at a time when we are losing so many young adults, particularly young women in the church, this should cheer want your heart as it did mine. From a senior at, an all, at a Catholic all-girls high school in Massachusetts, she wrote, when my class viewed the Catholic Women Preach website, I was overcome with joy. There is such a need in this world for women to be represented in the preaching of the good news and of the full richness of God's love." End quote. 
I propose to you, isn't it high time we begin to identify people, regardless of their status as ordained religious or lay, who have particular gifts to offer and reimagine how we can harness this collective talent that matches capability and potential with role and need? The sexual abuse crisis has been the backdrop of my entire service to the church. Following the revelations in 2002, Leadership Roundtable was created. I was asked by Jeff Boisey, the founder, to serve as the founding executive director. It's a network of senior level leaders from all walks of life, all Catholic, ordained religious and lay, who share two things in common, an astonishingly high level of CEO level expertise and a profound love of the church. We harness their collective managerial experience, their financial acumen, and their problem-solving capability to strengthen the management, finances, communications, and human resource development of the church. We promote accountability, transparency, and best managerial practices. We are laser-focused on temporal affairs and do not wade into doctrinal matters. Consequently, everything we offer is faithful to magisterial teaching. Every resource we create is vetted through the lens of canon law. We avoid the neuralgic issues that divide and separate Catholics. Today, a large part of our service to the church is responding to the 50 dioceses that contacted us immediately last summer when the second wave of crisis crashed on the shores of the church in the U.S. We are working at the national and global level to affect recovery and reform, provide justice for victim survivors, ensure accountability, competency, and co-responsibility, and restore trust in leadership and in the church. It is absolutely critical to preach about difficult subjects that are on the minds and hearts of the community, even when those difficult subjects include our own church's failures, sins, and crimes. I've spoken about my dearest friend, Father Bob. A year ago, he was diagnosed with glioblastoma, and for nine months from diagnosis to death, I accompanied him through treatment, dying, and death. He was dying and I was losing my closest colleague and friend at the height of the second wave of sexual abuse scandal. In stark contrast to the ongoing anger and shame and agony of the crisis were the thousands of handwritten letters from grateful parishioners, former students, and friends of Father Bob from all over the world. Again and again, I read him their testaments about his pastoral presence, his wisdom, his ministry of presence, and above all, his preaching. Testament after testament about how his preaching and spiritual leadership changed their lives transformed their lives, pointed them to meaning and lives of reconciliation, love, generosity, and deep and abiding faith, and brought them closer to Christ. In closing, the truth is a well-crafted homily, beautiful music and hospitality conspire to create meaningful liturgies. Excellent preaching is not only crucial, its opposite can have a wholly deleterious effect on one's active participation in the celebration of the Eucharist. The best homilists make it look easy, but in fact take hours of preparation to ensure the quality of both content and delivery. Not everyone is a naturally gifted preacher, but everyone can improve and be accountable. This is surely one reason why you all are here. It is always worth the effort. Father Burghardt was resolute that one should, quote, never settle for a good word when the best word is better. Excellent preaching matters and should not be rare in our Catholic parishes and other faith settings and communities, nor should the onus of responsibility lie solely on the pastor's shoulders. Lay people have important ways to contribute, support, encourage, and hold pastors accountable for excellence in preaching. And whenever possible, in whatever settings and contexts possible, lay preaching matters too, especially that of women. Let me end where I began. 
Thank you for breaking open the word, for sharing the good news, for your commitment to ongoing education and formation, for prioritizing excellent preaching, for preparing well, for incorporating preaching into your leadership and your leadership into your preaching. Thank you, professors and coaches. Thank you for bringing us closer to Christ, helping us come to know and understand what it means to be Christian. Thank you for encouraging us, sustaining us, holding us accountable, pointing us to the transcendent, and offering us the hope and the joy of the gospel. Thank you.